Um, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55. If you're using one of those Bibles in the seats, it's on page 576. Um, just a heads up, um, over, so we just passed Christmas, um, and we are obviously, um, and over the next few weeks, what we're going to be, what we're going to be leaning into is we're going to talk a lot about the gospel, about how God, what, about God's ways and his thoughts, and, um, and how all that affects our relationship with other people. Uh, we're going to do that, we're going to talk about that for a few weeks, and then as we uh, enter into January, a little bit later in January, we're going to dive back into the book of Exodus, and we're going to look at the Ten Commandments. Um, and I'm really excited about that. So uh, we'll, that'll be coming up later in January, um, so look forward to that. Today, as, as we work through God's Word, as we, as we look at God's Word, I just ask that you keep your Bible open, because this is one of those times where just... Of a particular word makes all the difference. And so we're going we're gonna to look really closely at the specifics of what God says this morning. This is, this might, if you've been in the, in the church for, for any number of years, this is, this is probably a familiar passage to you, at least part of it. Um, but God is, is a lot more specific in it than what, than what we often think he is. So let's, let's dig in. Isaiah chapter 55, we're going to read the whole, the whole chapter. So hear the word of the Lord. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know. And a nation that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. So seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty. It shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing. And all the trees of the fields shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come the, up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to you, God. Our thoughts are not like your thoughts, and our ways are not like your ways. Teach us the truth of that this morning. Teach us, teach us why that's true and how specifically that's true. And Lord, God, we ask that you would break forth joy and peace and faith and repentance and love for, for you, especially for you, and through that love that you would pour it out upon Upon we would pour it out upon one another, our neighbors, our friends, our enemies, the people that frustrate us, the people that work with us, 
people that go to school with us. Lord, it just so happens that the very thing that we, that is the easiest thing to believe about you is the thing that we tend to disbelieve the most. That you really are a God who entered in and came for sinners. Help us. Help us to grow in your word and to know you. To really know you. And conform us, through your spirit, conform us to you, to your image, God. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, um, I love this, this chapter. And, and honestly, I was thinking about it this morning. Every week, I, I kind of say that I'm, we're kind of coming at one of my favorite parts of Scripture. Because every week, I, I get to dive in and, and, and I get to preach the Word. This one actually is, is, partic- is one that I particularly go to a lot. I love it. And I hope that, and I, and, and I hope that we, as we dig into the specifics of it, you'll, you'll see it afresh, even if it's very familiar to you. You know, sometimes, um, like, we, we used to have a sign out there that, that, had, that we put letters up on and, and changed the letters out on and changed the message. Ted, you did that for us for a long time. Thank you for that, by the way. Um, and every once in a while, we'd put up a phrase that says, all, all sinners are welcome. And that's meant to kind of be arresting, right? I mean, like, yeah, but we mean it. All sinners are welcome here. We are to, God commands us to welcome others as God in Christ has welcomed us. It's one of the easiest things to say, right? And it's one of the hardest things to do. It's hard, I think, because we are uncomfortable and we struggle not only with our sin, but other people who are caught up in their sin. Particularly sins that we find less acceptable. Because we all have our acceptable sins that we kind of we skate by. And if, but if we're really honest about those things, Christ shed his blood for those. They're very serious. But the most obvious truth about our God, that Jesus came for sinners, is the thing we find easiest to believe. And I think it's the thing that we find the easiest to disbelieve as well. It won't do us any good to act like that's not true, though. The Word of God here tells us that. We're going we're gonna to look at that more closely. But God says, my, my thoughts and my ways are not like your thoughts and your ways. And it's specifically on this point. And this isn't to, to beat us up. This is this is to, to focus us in on who God really is. Let's, as, we, as we dive in, I want you to consider what makes you nervous, what makes you anxious about, about other people in their sin. Why do, why, why do we hesitate to enter into, into relationships with people? Why do we hesitate to invite them into our lives? Let's consider those things as we consider God's word. Let's look at verse 1. Consider who God invites. He says, come everyone who thirsts. Everyone who thirsts. Everyone who has no money. In fact, in fact, as he goes on, it's, it's not only the people who are thirsty and have no money, but it's the people who spend everything they have on things that don't satisfy Things that don't satisfy. God commands them to come. Invites them to come. That is the best news, isn't it? That is the best news. That's what faith is. Coming to God on his terms. With nothing to give but our need. There's, in the Heidelberg Catechism... There, which is a discipleship tool that churches like ours have used for hundreds of years. Um, 
it defines faith in a very similar way to the way I just said it, but just in, in a little bit more expansively in some different words. And I wanted to read it to you and just consider this. True faith is not only a sure knowledge by which, by which I hold true all that God has revealed to us in Scripture. All, true faith means I believe everything God says. God is true. But it is also a wholehearted trust which the Holy Spirit creates in me by the gospel that God has freely granted not only to others but to me also. Forgiveness, eternal righteousness, and salvation. These are gifts of sheer grace granted solely by Christ's merit. Not only others but to me also. Faith is you know, the way that faith is used in, in our common language tends to be like, have a good attitude about stuff. Like, like, have a positive outlook and good things will come. That's not what the Bible means by faith. Faith grasps hold of the good news wholeheartedly and trust, that God, trust the God who says, come everyone who thirsts. Everyone. And that he's really inviting you into that. You aren't too far gone. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter your upbringing. There's, and there's no sin so vile that God cannot and will not wash you clean when you come. But that, that phrase, not only to others, but to me also, that's, that's a two-edged sword. Because that means, that means, my friends, that I need forgiveness. That means I need Christ's eternal righteousness. That means that I need a Savior because no matter how hard I try, I can't save myself, not even a little. That's faith. That is what faith is, and that is what we want, that's how we want to grow, what we want to grow into. It is given by God. It is something that we first get by asking. Let's look at verse 2. God, God comes at it again. Why do you spend your money for that which isn't bread? Why? Why are you going after something that's not going to satisfy? Why do, we, why do we chase after all these false gods to satisfy these needs? Why do we chase after even good things and put them in God's place and think that they're going to satisfy us in some, some way? And all we can do, what, whereas all we can do is just hide our, our deep dissatisfaction. And we keep going, but we keep going back to these things. Even good things. Your husband or your wife. I mean, guys, when, when I'm... Uh, when I'm doing marriage counseling and, and at a wedding, I'll always tell the, the husband and the wife, this person was not made to make you happy, and it is not fair for you to expect that. It's not okay. It's sinful, in fact, for you to ex expect that. But it's not just in our marriages. Our, our children, our, our single people, marriage in general, as though you're not already whole in Christ. Like, like, I need this relationship, otherwise I'll never be whole. That's a lie. But it also comes by, you know, money, work. Like all the things that we, we normally think, of, think about. Security, safety, good health. All those things that we hold up that as long as, we think that as long as those are, are, are in place, we're going to be satisfied, but they never satisfy us. Not to mention the sins that we get our, ourselves into. The sex and the, the pornography and greed and violence and, power and, and chasing after power. and All these things, they call to us day and night. They say, this time for sure, this time, this time I'm really going to satisfy you. All of them are liars. All of them are liars. An idol, they're all idols. They, they, they promise everything. They take everything. And they give nothing. 
They never lift a finger to actually save you. They never lift a finger to actually satisfy what you desire. And yet we keep going back. As though this time you're going to get what you need. Why do you spend your money, God says, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Maybe because we're having a hard time accept, ex, accepting that God really is who he says he is. Maybe that's part of it. And God, do a work in us that we would, we would accept, that, accept where we disbelieve that. Who you say that you are. Where our faith falls short. You never fall short, God. Let's look at, look at verses, the second half of verse 3 um, to 5. Well, I mean, look at verse 3. God says, incline your ear, like lean in, right? He says, he says hear. When, when God commands us to hear, he means understand and obey every time. Hear. Come to me. Come to me, he's saying. I'm not a transactional God. I'm not waiting for you to get yourself right. I'm not actually, I don't, I don't need anything. I don't need, I don't need you. I'm not waiting for you to get yourself in order. Just come. Just come. And this is, God says, this is what I'm going to do when, when you come. You shall call a nation, in verse 5, you shall call a nation you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you. What God is going to do, he, he says he's going to wrap, in verses 3 and 4, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap you up in the promise I made to David. I'm going to wrap you up in that promise, and you are going to reign forever and ever. That's what the Bible's talking about. It's it, when... When in like the book of Revelation it says, I'll make you king, a kingdom and priest and you will reign forever and ever. That is, that's what the Bible's talking about. Wrapping it up, wrapping all God's people up into God's promise to David. <laughs> and a nation that you don't, you're, that you're going to call a nation you don't know and a nation that doesn't know you, that isn't on your side, that doesn't know God from Adam is going to run to you when you when that, that invitation comes through you. Come. Come. What does that all mean, though? Like, what does that tell you about God? And this is where we really need to pay attention. Not that you didn't need to before. God says in verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. The uh, unrighteous there, the, the iniquitous man. The, we, we're not talking about a call going to good people, but the desperately wicked. That, that invitation in verse 1 is the same, is, this, this, he's addressing the same group here. Not those who got themselves together, but those who are actually in their core desperately wicked. He says, come, let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return. Let, let her repent. Let, turn from your own ways. Repentance is turning from your own way and surrendering to God's ways. Let them do that. Let them find that God, as God says in verse 7, let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. That's not just good news. That is the best news. But there's a catch. To do that, you have to give up your own thoughts in your own ways. Because because, as it says in, ver in, in verse 8, you'll see, uh, you'll see the word for or because. And that is critical. That is a critical piece of, a uh, sp specific piece of information for us. Because my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. Let me, what does God mean by that? Let me kind of flip that around, flip set verses 7 and 8 around a little bit so that we can understand it better. Because my thoughts are not like yours. 
because your ways are not my ways. Let the desperately wicked return to the Lord that he, can have, that he will have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. The very purpose, the, the very purpose of this word, the very, or I'm sorry, the very ground of the call to the wicked is the fact that God means to have compassion from his very heart. God's heart pours out in compassion on the one who does not deserve it. That remains true throughout our lives. He abundantly forgives the one who needs abundant forgiveness. His compassion and forgiveness will never, has never, will never have anything to do with what, you, what we deserve. We have such trouble understanding God's thoughts and ways, I think, for this reason. And, and hear what God says. He's saying, not, not just specifically, not just specifically, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts and my ways are higher than your ways. We, we've all, I think that's a fairly familiar sort of verse, and that could generally be applied to everything, right? But God is very specifically applying it to his heart of compassion for the wicked, for the sinner. You're not like me in this way, God says. Even though we like to think we are. We can't seem to wrap our heads around the way that God leans in and gives himself to the worst of sinners. Like the prostitute washing Jesus' feet with her snotty tears in her hair. And the the, the tax-collecting thug that has betrayed his own people and how Jesus enters in and, and eats with him. We, we can't wrap our heads around a God who does that. And so we get nervous. We get nervous with other people's sin. We get nervous, we get anxious about how to respond to them. We hesitate to share our lives with theirs. We we think that what they most need to know before they leave, if they're, if, if, when, a, when anyone comes into, into worship with us, especially if they don't have one of those acceptable sins, that they need to know that they're a sinner before they leave. And we need to be the ones who tell them. And we talk about sin a lot, but I'm never going to let you do that. I'm never going to let you look at the other person down the row and not yourself. Maybe they do need to hear that. But what makes you think God is telling you to do it? Or telling us to do it? What makes you think he doesn't want you to just give them the invitation to come? Because the reality is that that invitation, that the only way that they can come is the only way that you can come. They're going, to have to, they're going to have to come. They're going to have to lay down all their sin and their self-righteousness and their pride just like you. And just like you, everyone will need to lay down every, that down every day and they'll have to grasp hold of Jesus. And just like you, they'll need to be united to Jesus, bringing nothing but their own need. Just like you, They will need to turn from their own ways and surrender to God's. Just like you. It's the invitation you need to hear. God's command to come. God is the only one who gets to invite and command at the same time. And there be no no conflict to that. Because His heart is mercy and compassion. And so, everyone who comes into this church, everyone who comes into this body, everyone who who we meet in our lives, they need to hear that too. They don't need need you to, to, to bang them over the head. They need to come and meet the Lord. From his very heart, God has compassion on the wicked. 
the undeserving. The ones who not only are, are helpless and thirsty and tired and have no money, but the ones who keep spending all that they do have on things that don't satisfy, on idols, on worthless things. And if God's like that, why do we feel hesitation with other people in our lives? Why do we feel, why do we hesitate when someone is sitting next to us that we're, we're uncomfortable with the way they live their lives? Is it not because in some part of your heart, you want it to be true that God accepts you right now because you got it right. I think, I think when we're honest with ourselves, we do, there, there are spaces in our hearts that that's true. That's where our sin comes from, by the way. Maybe other, maybe other sinners remind you that, that your life is not all put together. And maybe, maybe you think that if you admit that this invitation to the desperately wicked is not just for others, but also for me. And I can't go on just self-assured that thinking that everything's just okay. I want you to find satisfaction and rest. I want to find that. We'll only get it by coming to Jesus with nothing but our need. That is exactly the good news that everyone who comes to be with us needs to hear. The Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, is the only one who can satisfy. He's not a transactional God. You know what I mean, right? He's not a God who says, I'll give you this, but I'm going to take, I need to take a bunch of stuff here. The only thing he takes from us is our sin. He simply requires that you come. This has been on my mind, actually, for for a few weeks. Uh, A few weeks ago, we had a family meeting. We had our our congregational meeting. And if you were here, you would have heard at the end of the meeting, um, a great question was asked. We're talking about we're talking about something really serious. And um, we were, I was asked whether we should, whether, whether we should invite friends um, who are gay. Like, is this a safe place for them? People who have been wounded by the church, who are afraid and terrified that they're going to walk in and they're going to be hurt and not loved. That's a serious question. It's a great question. Because honestly... Most of us have been hurt in the church in some way. And most of us have hurt others in the church in some way too. We won't ever be a safe refuge for any sinner at all until we grasp the truth that we need to conform our thoughts and ways to God's. And specifically this way that Isaiah has been telling us. That God's heart is is to have compassion. And, and to have a, pour out abundant forgiveness upon any and all who come to him. That's what, that's, we need to conform our thoughts and our hearts to that, to what God, who God is. That's what he commands. But here's the thing. That's God's command. To conform, to conform to his ways, to his thoughts. The problem is we can't do it. Because if we could, we would have. We can't do it. Because of the simple truth that, as it says in 1 Timothy 1, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sin- sinners, of whom I am the foremost. If we can't grasp that, we're not, going to be a safe, we're not going to be a safe people for even each other, let alone anybody else who comes. I don't like facing up to that reality. 
It means that I, again, we, again, have to go, with, go to Jesus, lay down our, my, my, our, I have to lay down my self-righteousness and my pride, and I have to go to Jesus with nothing in my hands again. And most of the time, I don't know about you, that takes the form of, man, again? I thought I was through this. It means we actually have to intentionally really put away the lies that, are, that, that we tell ourselves and that are being told us in those moments when we're chasing after things that don't satisfy. We have to put to death that, that voice that keeps saying, just one more time, just one more time. I'll, this will satisfy you this time. This, God's not telling you the truth. That little voice that keeps saying that. He doesn't really love, he might not really love you like that. He doesn't really mean it when he says it. That his very purpose is to have compassion and to pardon. But here's the good news Jesus came. He lived the life that you couldn't live so that his his righteousness could be yours. He died the death that you couldn't, that, that you deserved. And he rose again that we might have life. When we come to Jesus, we find compassion and we find forgiveness because that is who God is. He requires us to bring nothing else just to come. That is good news. That is the best news. Where aren't you believing that today? Where aren't you believing that today? You may have, you may have heard the gospel uh, once twice, ten times, maybe a thousand times, maybe a million times in your life. I don't know how long you've been in church. I don't know what, how, what kind of churches you've been at. I'm becoming more and more convinced the more I think about it that this next year God is doing a work that will implant this truth that, that Christ Jesus came for sinners of whom I am the foremost. That that would, that would stop being words on a page that would start being the reality of our hearts, that we would recognize the, 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 the truth and the life-giving change that happens as a result. Believe that. Believe that and be satisfied. Believe that and, and be reconciled to each other. Believe that and, and let love actually define who you are in your relationships to other people. Not anxious, not thinking all the time, man, I hope, that, I hope this person doesn't walk away thinking that I think that they're doing the right thing, because I don't. When we, when we embrace the reality that, that God tells us about who he is, about how we are not like him, God actually uses that to make us like him. His spirit is doing a work in us. His spirit implants that in our hearts and works through us to give this sort of invitation to others. As we just pass in Christmas and we're going to start a new year, I, guys, I, I hope that we become more and more a people. I want to be more and more a man who opens his arms wide to people who, who are hurt, are suffering, people who are in their sin and don't know why things are the way they are. Maybe they're mad. Maybe they just even come in. Maybe, they'll, maybe we'll find people come in, in here who just want to like Stick it in our eyes because, they, because they've been hurt before. Or they expect to be hurt. But 
be conformed to, Christ, to God in this. The only way you can do it is through Jesus. You cannot do it on your own. So Jesus, change our hearts. Lord, I... As we, as we have gone through this year and even these last two years with a lot of heartache and a lot of, a lot of pain and a lot of relational difficulty and stress, and some of it just from things that are part of life, the struggles we have around loss and grief, depression, shame, Even as that's been ratcheted up, God, you've been doing a work in us, in this little people. You have poured out opportunity after opportunity. You have, you have in this place, even in the last couple of weeks, you've brought, you've brought someone to know, to, to know and acknowledge that you are Lord. God, through the ministry of the church plant that, that meets here at night. And you are the one who opened our hands. Continue to do this work but change us from the inside out, Lord. Change us, transform our hearts that we would, we would grasp the truth that Jesus came for sinners of whom I am the foremost. Never looking down the row, never looking across the street. Then we'll have real good news. Lord, we ask that you would bring many sons and daughters to glory. Raise up many to, to speak of your grace, of your forgiveness. And God, that people would come in truth. We love you and we trust you. And we thank you. We thank you for your faithfulness, for your covenant, for your mercy and for your steadfast love. In Jesus' name, amen. I said, I told you, I've been telling you the last few minutes um, in a variety of different ways. The only way, the only, only, only way to accept this invitation is to come to God with nothing but your need. And my friends, as, as far as you are down the, the, the walk and the... the the life of faith. That's still the truth. In fact, if, as the farther you get down in the life, down the life of faith, the more, the, the more you embrace, the more we embrace that, the more we rejoice that God invites us and we come running to Jesus again and again. That's what it looks like to grow. And so this meal that we're about to receive is... Um, is a feast that speaks to that in such an awesome way, such a beautiful way that we celebrate week after week. This is a feast of remembrance, communion, and hope. We come remembering that Jesus Christ perfectly fulfilled God's law even to death on the cross. And because he did, we are accepted. We, even sinners, Desperately wicked are accepted and can never be forsaken. And we come to commune with the same Christ who has promised to be with us always, even to the end of the age. <laughs> Jesus is the bread that nourishes us. Jesus is the, is the vine in whom we must abide if we're going to bear any fruit. And as, as we come, we are united as one body in one spirit, in Christ's love, and in our affection for one another. God's heart of compassion, his, his delight to pour out abundant forgiveness is for you, people of God. And this is a feast of hope, because as surely as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we will be raised up when Jesus comes. And we'll be, we will be like he is. If, 
you have turned from your own ways and surrendered to God's ways. Not perfectly, but with the Spirit's help day by day. If that's you, you're a Christian, and this table is for you. But if you're still wondering who God is, no, if you're, if you're still not sure that God is actually this good, that, God, that, that God's not trying to sell you something, if you're not sure there uh, about that, then, then don't come to the table yet. Not because we want to exclude. We don't want to exclude you. We want you to come in faith and in reality. This, this table means nothing apart from faith. That not only others, but I also have been, been made forever right with God through Jesus Christ. The way we do this, um, if you haven't been with us before, we, we go to the middle and kind of come around the sides. You, the, the elders are here at the, at the front. Just please come and they will serve you. Please bring, your, bring the elements back to your seats and we will receive this meal together. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, our Lord took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And on the same night, he took the cup. And he blessed it. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for many. Many. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The Bible says as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So people of God, when you are ready, come to the table. Come and feast on Christ.